Brilliant. <clears throat> Great answer. Brother Mark signing on, uh, continuing the series on the history of Catholicism in the United States with the final installment of the decade of the 1880s. November 6th, 1888, uh, Benjamin Harrison <clears throat> halted the goal of Grover Cleveland to be a two-term president, at least for the time being. Harrison lost the popular vote to Cleveland, but he won a plurality of the Electoral College, 233 to 168, making Benjamin Harrison president number 23. Harrison was the grandson, Benjamin Harrison was the grandson of the ninth president, William Henry Harrison. <clears throat> Benjamin was born in North Bend, Ohio. After graduating from Miami University, now that's in Oxford, Ohio, not the Miami in Florida, he relocated to Indiana where he practiced law and joined the new Republican Party. He fought, uh, he volunteered for the Union and the Union Army during the Civil War. He rose to the rank of uh, commander of Indiana's 70, uh, the, the Indiana 70th, or the 70th Indiana, which, which was an infantry unit. After the war, he returned to Indiana, practiced law, became involved in politics, won election to the U.S. Senate. In the 1888 election, he was running against an incumbent president, Grover Cleveland. Uh, but he ran on a platform of protective tariffs and anti-monopoly promises. He fulfilled his campaign pledges by, as president by signing into law both high tariffs and he signed the famous Sherman Antitrust Act, which I think we covered already. Other nations, of course, retaliated. And this is whenever you do. So it's not just the idea of a tariff, but it, it's when it's too, as everybody, you know, all countries are going to protect some aspects of their trade. And they all understand that other countries are going to do that. But, you know, when it gets to be too much, then they then they retaliate. And that's it's happened before. We saw that when Jefferson did the tariff. But anyway, so they did it again. Uh, and other countries uh, retaliated by, by raising tariffs on American imports. The result was an economic spiral. And that economic that collapse, economic collapse, cost Benjamin Harrison re-election, along with his unsuccessful push to provide a federal program, federal level program, for African American education. Uh, so both of these factors together enabled Grover Cleveland to win a second term as president, uh, the first and so far the only person to have served two non-consecutive terms as president. Anyway, uh, Harrison enjoyed uh, the distinction of being the centennial uh, uh, president, um, not, uh, centen not the centennial of the country, but the centennial, uh, so uh, uh, Washington uh, was you know initially the country did not have the constitution so uh, Washington was inaugurated as the first president of the republic under the constitution in 1789 so Harrison was the was the centennial of POTUS of the you know the presidency of the United States in 1889. On March 23rd 1889, President Benjamin Harrison opened Oklahoma lands to settlement. Beginning on, it was announced and that it would, it would begin a month later on April 22nd, when the first of five land rushes or land runs uh, began, the, the Oklahoma land rush. More than 50,000 50, people waited at the starting line to race, you know, and then they, they would uh, claim that where they, what they, they, were, they the, the, the parcels were 100, 160 acres. So that, that's, you know, that you would get for, you know, it's a, all right. So um, this was not the first time, this it was the first time in the Oklahoma Territory, but but the idea had, had precedence. So uh, the Homestead Act of 1862 started the process across of settlement, of encouraging settlers, you know, to make the, the journey, which, you know, could be a life-threatening journey, to go to the West uh, and settle. And with the, the offer of free land, you know, that, that, that was the temptation. You get 160 acres, you know, for free. 
So the Homestead Act and the, the, the way they, they handled the uh, land distribution would, along with the expansion of the railroads into territories over the subsequent 40 years, uh, caused a, a wave of settlement in the West that forever changed the prairie from the Dakotas to Texas. 270 million acres would be uh, uh, given over to this from public land claimed by the federal government uh, that they offered up for, for private, you know, for private acquisition. And all they had to do was file. They, they had to file whenever one of these land rushes w- was open. They had to go to the, the land office. They, they, they filed, and the fee was $18. Uh, and then they got, you know, the paper they would need it to, you know, to do. Well, in Oklahoma, settlers had been using some of the Indian lands for grazing their animals. And, uh, and they continued to urge additional settlement rights on this land from the government. So these, uh, uh, the leaders of this, uh, the boosters of, of this Oklahoma land expansion were uh, a guy named C.C. C. Carpenter, uh, Daniel Payne, P-A-Y-N-E, and William Couch. So they finally uh, persuaded, they, you know, through lobbyists or what, you know, now, it, now we call them lobbyists, persuaded the federal government um, to do this. Now, these guys together purchased 3 million acres of land from the creek and the Seminole and made 1,900,000 acres open for settlement at noon on April 22nd, 1889. So those uh, who wished, who had, you know, made the, the fi- had filed, waited on the border of unassigned lands in Kansas border towns uh, and waited for a, a pistol shot, you know, and, and that signaled the opening. And then 50,000 people began a frantic race. Some had jumped, you know, had, had you know, cheated and, um, you know, snuck in, you know, to, to Oklahoma uh, while, while a relative or a friend or some, you know, ally partner had, had done the filing fee. Uh, Anyway, uh, one month later, the Indian Territories became the territory of Oklahoma through a, an act of Congress. Four years later, on September 16, 1893, uh, the largest land rush opening occurred on uh, Cherokee, on the Cherokee outlet in north central Oklahoma, uh, which included the Tonkawa and the Pawnee reservations, with more than another 50,000 people claiming 6,500,000 acres. By the end of the first day of the Oklahoma land rush of 1889, <clears throat> uh, 36,000 people registered for land in at uh, Orlando in the Oklahoma Territory, and additional lands were opened up uh, in uh, echelon fashion, with the final such land rush being 1895. Uh, on August... Uh, okay, we'll leave that. All right, uh, Rewinding, same year, 1889, May 31st, uh, the Jonestown flood occurred on a Friday, May 31st, after a catastrophic failure of the South Fork Dam located on the South Fork of the Little Conema, Conema River, that's C-O-N-E-M-A-U-G-H, Conema River, 14 miles upstream from the town of Jonestown, Pennsylvania. The dam ruptured after several days of extremely heavy rainfall. Uh, the flood uh, killed uh, over 2,000 people. Now, the village of Jonestown uh, was almost a century old. It was founded in 1800 by a Swiss, a Swiss immigrant named Joseph Johns, and he anglicized the name to Shantz. Um, and his name was Joseph Schantz, and he anglicized it to Joseph Schantz. Uh, and the town prospered with the building of the Pennsylvania Main Line Canal in 1836 
and construction in the 1850s of the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Cambria Iron Works. By 1889, Jonestown Industries had attracted numerous Welsh and German immigrants. With a population of 30,000, it was a growing industrial community uh, known for its steel. So it was not, I mean, not a, not a big city on the order of Philadelphia or New York, but, but still, you know, a place where somebody who was willing to work could go uh, get a job and make money. The high, steep hills of the narrow Konima Valley, uh, which is a valley in the Allegheny Mountains, uh, kept development close to the riverfront areas, uh, clustered, you know, in that way. The valley had large amounts of runoff from rain and snowfall in the Alleghenies, because, you know, going down, following gravity into the, into the valley. So the area surrounding Jonestown was always prone to flooding due to its location on the river. Um, above the city, uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, built, I mean, above, I mean north, north of the city, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania built a dam, the South Fork Dam, um, as part of a cross-state canal system. Jonestown was the eastern terminus of the Western Division Canal, supplied with water by Lake Conima and the reservoir created by that dam. As railroads superseded canal barge transport, the Commonwealth abandoned the canal and sold it to the Pennsylvania Railroad. The dam and the lake, the reservoir lake created by the dam, were part of the purchase, and the railroad privatized the sale. They, they sold it. They sold the dam and the reservoir to private interest. A group of uh, investors uh, led by Henry Clay Frick, uh, Benjamin Ruff uh, from Pennsylvania, purchased the reservoir. They modified it and converted it to a private resort lake for the wealthy. Development included lowering the dam to make its top wide enough to hold a road and putting a, a fish screen in the spillway uh, to, to also trap debris, so to puncture a hole, in other words, in the, in the spillway. So these alterations increased the vulnerability of the dam. Moreover, a system of relief pipes and valves, which were part of the original dam, <laughs> it's, you know, people that they, they were removed <laughs> by these guys and sold for scrap and not replaced. So that meant that the owners ha had no way to lower the water level in the lake in case of an emergency. And, and then they proceeded with their plan to make it a resort. So cottages, a clubhouse, you know, a, 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 a country club, you know, was, was made, a fishing club, a hunting club. Uh, make it a, pro, a mountain, you know, a retreat, a, a resort in the Allegheny Mountains. So membership grew to include uh, 50 uh, families, 50 wealthy families uh, who were in, involved in the steel, the coal, the railroad industries. And this was uh, the Lake Conima at the club site was 450 feet in elevation above Jonestown. The lake was about two miles long. The reservoir lake was two miles long, one mile wide, 60 feet deep. The dam was 72 feet high. So meaning it only had 12 feet of, you know, of cushion. You know, you could have 12 feet of rain or, or runoff or snow melt or whatever before it would go over the dam. Uh, and after, you know, and because of the, they didn't have any, because of, because they, because of what they did, uh, the, the, the dam was already springing leaks by 1881. And it was patched mostly with mud and straw, so which means it wasn't patched. So time passed. May 28, 1889, a low-pressure area formed over Nebraska and, Can and Kansas. By the time, you know, the, 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 the prevailing patterns blew it up, you know, to western Pennsylvania two days later, it had developed into what would be termed uh, the heaviest rainfall event that had ever been recorded up to that point in the United States. 
The U.S. Army Signal Corps estimated that 10 inches of rain fell in 24 hours over western Pennsylvania. During the night, small creeks became torrents, you know, rapids, you know, rivers, ripping out trees and debris. Telegraph lines, telegraph poles were downed. Railroad lines were, were undermined by the, you know, by the erosion and then washed away. Before daybreak, the Kanemaw River that ran through Jonestown was about to overflow its banks. On the morning of May 31st, in a farmhouse on a hill just north of the South Fork Dam, Elias Unger, president of that infamous club, the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, awoke to the site of Lake Kanemaw, swollen after a night-long heavy rainfall. Unger ran outside, in the still raining, to assess the situation, and he saw that the water was nearly cresting, so it had gone up that 12 feet from its normal 60-foot level to the height of the dam, which after they had lowered it was only 72 feet. So he quickly ran around. He assembled a group of men to try to save the dam uh, by trying to uh, unclog a spillway. But it was blocked by the broken fish trap and the debris caused by the swollen water line. Uh, so during the day in Jonestown, the situation worsened as water rose, the streets flooded, trapping people in their homes. Between 2.50 and 2.55 p.m., the South Fork Dam failed. The dam was breached. The first town to be hit was the town of South Fork. That town was on higher ground. So most of the people escaped by, simply by running up the, the nearby hill because it's, it's in a valley of the Allegheny when they saw the dam spill. Uh, but many houses were destroyed. Now, it turned out four people were killed in that town. But the, the water flow, you know, the tsunami from the failed dam continued downstream, aimed towards Jonestown, 14 miles west. The water picked up more debris, such as trees and houses, animal corpses, you know, and, and it's a... Uh, The, uh, let's see, all right, uh, before hitting the main part of Jonestown, the flood hit the Cambria Ironworks, sweeping up railroad cars and barbed wires. Uh, that, uh, that little town, Woodvale, around the Cambria Ironworks, uh, had 1,100 residents. 314 of them died. Boilers exploded in the ironworks. Uh, causing a black smoke screen that could be seen by Jonestown residents, but they still didn't realize how bad their life was going to become, you know, in, in, a, in an hour. So miles, literally miles, worth of barbed wire became entangled in the debris and the floodwaters. Fifty-seven minutes after the dam collapsed, the tsunami hit Jonestown. The residents were caught by surprise by the wall of water and debris, traveling at speeds of 40 miles per hour and reaching a height of 60 feet as it was funneled onto the town by the, by the Allegheny Mountains on either side of the, you know, the, the valley. Uh, the total death toll was originally calculated at 2,209, making it the largest the disaster that cost the largest loss of civilian life in the United States at the time, apart from epidemics. Earlier in this playlist, we covered you know cholera epidemics and things where more people died. But as far as a, a weather-related you know disaster, uh, this this uh, number of uh, deaths was later surpassed in terms of a uh, of weather-related uh, event by the by the 1900 Galveston hurricane. Uh, and later, you know, depending, I mean, obviously, the, you know, Pearl Harbor, the September 11th attacks, you know, there were more people died, but the, those were not uh, weather related. One of the first outsiders to arrive was Clara Barton, whom we met earlier uh, in the decade. She was uh, the uh, president of the American Red Cross. She arrived on June 5th, 1889, to lead the Red Cross's first major disaster relief effort. And she stayed for five months. Donations for the relief effort came from all over the United States and from other countries. Uh, $3.7 million, and that's in 1889 money, was collected uh, from the U.S. as well as 18 foreign countries. 
survivors uh, were unable, it turned out, were unable to recover damages in court because uh, uh, first, the, the club, the club owners were, were very wealthy. And they had designed the club's financial structure such that their personal assets were separate from it, like the club was separately incorporated. It was an LLC, essentially. And secondly, uh, it was difficult for any suit to prove that any individual owner had behaved negligently. Uh, As a result of this criticism, criticism from the failure of these people to be able to recover any damages. Uh, In the 1890s, state courts around the country adopted uh, Rylands v. Fletcher. That's R-Y-L-A-N-D-S v. Fletcher, F-L-E-T-C-H-E-R. Now, that was not an American case. It was a British case, but it was a British common law precedent, which had, prior to the Jonestown flood, had been largely ignored by U.S. courts. But after the Jonestown flood, and after it became obvious that these people you know, were, were not going to be able to recover any uh, of their losses from those who were actually responsible for you know, lowering the dam, uh, state courts started to adopt the reasoning of Rylands, which held that a non-negligent defendant could be held liable for damage caused by the unnatural use of land. And that foreshadowed the legal system's 20th century acceptance of strict liability. In criminal and civil law, strict liability is a standard under which a person is legally responsible for the consequences flowing from an activity even if, even in the absence of fault or criminal intent on the part of a defendant. All right? Now, that, that may sound unfair. It may, in fact, be unfair. But that's, that's how this entered into the law of the land and, you know, obviously, you know, created an entire industry based on lawsuits. And, uh, you know, which is, still affects the country today. On June 3rd, 1889, uh, the first long-distance electric power transmission cable was completed, spanning between the Willamette Falls and Portland in in Oregon, the state of Oregon. And uh, it was 14 miles, so spanned 14 miles. A proof of concept. November 13th, 1889, uh, the, next, the Catholic University of America was able to open for classes after the completion of the first building, which is now Caldwell Hall. And, uh, okay, we covered that. First students graduated 1889, but initially it was just a graduate school. Uh, and then in 1904, added an undergraduate program. The dedication ceremony was held on November 13th, 1889, and Archbishop Ireland, whom we've already met, gave the address. He proclaimed, in part, these words, quote, The past our fathers wrought. The future will be wrought by us. The next century and the life of the church will be what we make of it. Americans have a longing for a church without foreign aspects. It would wield no influence over them. I would have Catholics be the first patriots in the land. Obviously felt that such a development would not be possible if Catholic immigrants retained their own customs and languages. So like the other Americanists, he favored rapid assimilation. One month after that speech, bringing us to December 19th, 1889. Archbishop Ireland received a visit from a Slovakian-born, Ruthenian Rite, Uniate priest named Father Alexis Toth, T-O-T-H, lived from 1853 
to 1909. Toth recalled that after handling handing the bishop his papers, uh, as soon as he saw the word uniate, Archbishop Ireland asked him, Have you a wife? Father Toth said no. But you had a wife. Toth said yes, I'm a widower. At this, Toth later said that Archbishop Ireland threw the papers on the table and loudly exclaimed, I've already written to Rome protesting against this kind of priest being sent to me. Father Toth said, what kind of priest do you mean? Ireland said, your kind. Father Toth said, I am a Catholic priest in the Greek rite. I am a uniate. I was ordained by a lawful Catholic bishop. According to Toth, Ireland responded, I do not consider you or this bishop of yours to be Catholic. <clears throat> After Toth left, uh, Ireland directed a local Polish, uh, ethnically Polish priest, but Latin rite, to denounce Toth from the pulpit. And Ireland published a decree summoning all Catholics in, in his jurisdiction to renounce Father Toth. Okay, so what, what, what is this all about? All right, the first problem is uh, in 1889, the Byzantine rite, the Greek rite, you know, the uniate, none of the uniate rites, had official status, official canonical status in, in the United States as, as an organization. So Eastern rite priests arrived, they came from some other country, and they, they arrived uh, with rites of jurisdiction from their ordinaries back home, whatever country they came from, Slovakia, Hungary, Greece. But once in America, once in the United States, they served communities independent of one another. So you met a, a Ruthenian Rite group, you know, might get together and found a church. Then so you have a, you know, a Greek Rite troop would do, church would do, group would do the same. But all of them were within the territories of 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 dioceses as stipulated by the by the Catholic Church by the by the Latin Rite of the Roman Roman you know Church, and those bishops were either unaware of those activities, or didn't care, or in some cases um, like Ireland, were unwilling to accept their presence in the diocese. You know, with that like someone like Ireland, he said, "Well, okay, you're, you're you're not in Slovakia anymore. You know, so you're here, and if you're Catholic." Then just go to the just go to the Catholic Church. I mean, you don't need a separate church. All right. So numerous instances reveal that when Eastern Rite priests arrived in the United States, they were not well received by their Latin Rite contemporaries. It was clear that the discipline of clerical celibacy was one of the main reasons for the hostility displayed by Roman Catholic clergy, because the Eastern Rite priest. Well, let's just say, okay. The Eastern Rite, Eastern Rite churches would or would ordain a married man. But if that guy's wife died after ordination, he could not remarry. October 20th, 1890, the first gathering of Ruthenian priests in the United States met in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, to consider among themselves how they should navigate life in the predominantly Latin Rite Catholic setting in which they found themselves. So they decided to petition Rome to appoint a vicar general to oversee all uniate churches in the United States. So in a sense, we're back to the, you know, should ethnic parishes, ethnic dioceses. In December of the following year, Ruthenian clergy gathered again and wrote a formal document uh, requesting it again. The intermediary between the Ruthenian clergy and the Pope's representatives was another priest named Nicephorus Kenneth, C-H-A-N-N-A-T-H. He was a personal friend, a close personal friend of Father Toth. So he knew about that episode, that, that, that horrible meeting that Toth had with Archbishop Ireland. Kenneth was not only... Uh, well, anyway, okay. Uh, he continued in this role until 1896, um, but he could not curb the factionalism 
so you, you have so he he was supposed to represent informally. I mean, he didn't have canonical status, but you know they they representatives of the different UNIA churches wanted him to serve as an intermediary with the American hierarchy as well as with Rome. But while while he was trying to do that, those UNIA groups among themselves, like the Melkites, the Marianites, the the uh, uh, the Ruthenians, that they got into conflict with each other. Right. So in the end, Kenneth's mission, you know, was not as successful as, as they had hoped. Uh, Toth, after the experience with Ireland, became an energetic advocate for, uh, for the Russian Orthodox Church, for the Ruthenian, the Uniates, who had been in union with Rome, to sever their union with Rome and simply... You know, go back, join the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, so Toth led a major, you know, schism, a, a major, you know, provoked by Ireland. In the end, by the turn of the century, two hundred and twenty-five thousand Ruthenian Rite Uniates who had been in union with Rome left under Toth's leadership and joined the Russian Orthodox Church in the United States. So successful was Toth in influencing Eastern Rite Catholic Uniates to become Orthodox that on May 24, 1994, he was canonized a saint by the Orthodox Church in America. Uh, all right, uh, these tensions, you know, continued. Uh, and, I, well, I'll just... just uh, after Vatican II, uh, Pope Paul VI, in the course of Vatican II and after Vatican II, Pope Paul VI insisted that in the East there had never been a debate over the fact that some priests were celibate and others were married, and that married clergy was part of the East tradition. So as Paul VI put it, the Eastern Rite priest can be married, quote, uh, is due to the different historical background of that most noble part of the Church a situation which the Holy Spirit has providentially and supernaturally influenced, end quote. Uh, this was again asserted um, in uh, 2014, on June 14th, when Pope Francis ratified uh, a document titled Pontifical Precepts about Married Eastern Clergy, declaring that married Eastern clergy have full rights to practice their ministry in all territories of the Church, even those places outside the traditional Eastern Territory, which would include the United States. Okay. Uh, same year as that, that horrible episode, 1889. Uh, Mother Cabrini arrived in New York. Uh, Francis Xavier Cabrini. Uh, she was uh, later became the first naturalized citizen of the United States to be canonized. She was canonized on July 7th, 1946. All right, so this lady was born Francesca Saverio Cabrini, C-A-B-R-I-N-I. -I. Uh, Francis was born on July 15th, 1850, in, uh, well, in Italy, in Lombardy, in northern Italy. But at that point, for reasons we cover in the medieval and modern history, Courses which have their separate playlist on this channel. Uh, Lombardy at that the time of her birth was part of the Austrian Empire, so she was born a citizen of the Austrian Empire, but was ethnically and in terms of territory, you know, born on the peninsula of Italy. She was the youngest of thirteen children. Father's name Agostino, mother's name Stella. They were cherry tree farmers and did pretty well. Only four of the thirteen children survive beyond adolescence and that that was that was characteristic of infant mortality at the time she was born two months premature so she was very small you know very sickly as a child remained in delicate health uh, during her childhood she once visited an uncle who was a priest uh, luigi as that well don as they call him in italy don, don luigi oldini father oldini uh, who lived beside a canal at age 13 Francesca, Francis, Francesca, attended a school run by the Daughters of the Sacred Heart. Five years later, she graduated cum laude with honors with a teaching certificate. 
After the death of her parents in 1870, she applied for admission to the religious congregation of the Daughters of the Sacred Heart at Arluno, Italy. These sisters were her former teachers, but uh, and many of them liked her, you know, and advocated for her. But the superiors told her that her health was just too frail, that they didn't, you know, they didn't. I mean, it, it, like they didn't deny she had a vocation, but she said, "Well, you're in poor health, so we're not going to accept you." And you, you know, interpret that how you, as how you will. Uh, but she still was kind of a filly. I mean, they they still liked her, so. Um, she got a job as uh, in ch- being in charge of a house of uh, an orphanage at uh, uh, Cardona, where she taught, and uh, and she just was part of the community. She just wasn't married, and there were other unmarried women that uh, came came around to help at the orphanage, and so they informally initially uh, lived a religious way of life among themselves. You know, they prayed together. They did involved in this work. And it, you know, it was doing pretty well. So on her own, Cabrini and this group uh, took religious vows, private, private religious vows in 1877. And she added, she gave to her, took on her own, uh, a name, a religious name of Xavier in honor of the Jesuit St. Francis Xavier, whom we covered in the, uh, in the uh, modern history, in the early modern history playlist on this channel. Uh, he was a patron saint of missionary service. In November of 1880, uh, Francis, now Xavier, and six other women who had taken those private vows with her decided to, you know, take the next step, and they founded a a society, the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and their postnomial initials were MSC. So Mother Cabrini composed a rule, a regular, and constitutions for this religious institute. And she continued as its superior general until her death. As a ministry, the sisters took in uh, orphans and foundlings, plus they opened a day school. And, uh, well, the orphans they took in for free, but the school they charged, they charged money, and they used that money to support themselves as well as to support the orphans. Uh, The Institute uh, expanded, as, you know, as funds allowed, establishing seven homes Uh, and a a nursery and a school within its first five years. The success and the good works that they were doing brought uh, Cabrini, as well as her little group, to the attention of the bishop, Bishop of Piacenza, uh, who approved, and later that bishop was uh, beatified as Blessed Giovanni Scalabrini, Bishop of Piacenza. And then through him, she came to the attention of Pope Leo XIII. In September of 1877, Mother Cabrini went to Rome to seek approval of the Pope to establish missions in China. Instead, he suggested to her that she go to the United States to minister to Italian immigrants who were flooding into that nation, mostly because of the poverty in Italy. So he told her not to the east, but to the west. And she did. So Cabrini left for the United States, arrived in New York City on March 31st, 1889, along with six other sisters. In New York, she encountered disappointment and difficulties. Archbishop Corrigan, whom we already met, was not immediately supportive of this. Uh, He did find them housing. Uh, he put them up, or he just essentially commanded the Sisters of Charity, just, you know, put these, put, put them up. Um, and, and, you know, just kind of left so they, they could stay there. They live there. So they weren't just, you know, roaming the street. Uh, she did obtain permission from Corrigan to establish an orphanage, uh, which uh, now is, is known as, uh, the Mother Cabrini home in West Park, New York. Mother Cabrini organized catechism classes and, uh, education classes for Italian immigrants and provided for the needs of many orphans. She established schools and orphanages despite tremendous obstacles and uh, of you know, many of a financial nature. Uh, she proved to be very resourceful as well as prayerful. You know, she had that, that combination, which is not always uh, the case of someone who is very spiritual, very devout, uh, but, but could also be 
very effective, you know, practically in, 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 you know, in, in terms of, of business and temporalities. In New York City, she founded uh, a hospital, uh, Columbus Hospital, uh, and, uh, and, and a, another hospital, the Italian Hospital. And they lasted until the 1980s uh, when they merged to form Cabrini Medical Center. Uh, oh, no, I hit the wrong thing. In Chicago, the sisters expanded, and they opened uh, Columbus Extension Hospital, which was later renamed as St. Cabrini Hospital in the heart of Chicago's Italian immigrant neighborhood on the, the near on the west side. Uh, she founded uh, a total of 67 institutions in New York, Chicago, De Plaine, Illinois, Seattle, Washington, New Orleans, Louisiana, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, Denver, Colorado, Golden, Colorado, Los Angeles, California, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and uh, her sisters uh, established more throughout South America and Europe. All right, New Orleans. Mother Cabrini expanded her ministry to New Orleans uh, because of an appalling ethnic hate crime against Italians, you know, her fellow Italians. Uh, on the evening, all right, the background of this, the hate crime occurred on March 14th, 1891. Remember, nothing just happened, so there's backgrounds to this, uh, which takes us back to the previous year. On the evening of October 15, 1890, the police chief of the city of New Orleans, who was ethnically Irish, his name was David Hennessy. There's still a street named, named, uh, named after him in New Orleans. Uh, he was shot by several gunmen as he walked home from work. Hennessy returned fire, chased his attackers before collapsing from blood loss. Uh, you know, people heard, and they, they went to him, and as he was fading, they, they asked, who shot you? And, you know, he reportedly whispered to uh, another police officer, William O'Connor, a word, uh, one of the derogatory racial terms for Italian. Now, if I use the term YouTube sent, you know, they'll probably take down the channel, so I won't use it. Just so he used a derogatory, you know, racial slur, which indicated Italians had shot him and then he died. Uh, but he, he never named the shooters. I mean, like he, he didn't he didn't say a name, you know, OK, oh, this guy. Uh, the next day, complications set in and he died. Now, there had been. An ongoing feud in New Orleans between two Italian immigrant families, the Provenzano family and the Matrana family. They were business rivals on the New Orleans waterfront. And at the time, New Orleans was the second busiest port in the country, second only to New York. Hennessy, the police chief, had put several members of the Provenzano family in prison. And uh, they were convicted, you know, went to prison. But they had an appeal coming up. According to some reports in the newspaper, uh, Hennessy had been planning to offer new evidence uh, that would clear the Provenzanos, even though he had put them in jail, that, that you know, he found new evidence that would clear them and instead implicate members of the other family, the Matrana family. If true, this would mean that the Matranas, not the Provenzanos, had motive for the murder. A policeman who was a friend of Hennessy's later testified that Hennessy had told him he had no such plans. But in any case, it was widely believed that Hennessy's killers were Italians. Local newspapers of the time, such as the Times Democrat and the Daily Picayune, uh, freely and, and often uh, proclaimed that Italians had committed the murder, though even in print they used the racial slur for Italians. So the murder was quickly followed by a roundup, a mass mass arrest of 250 local Italian immigrants. The mayor of New Orleans at the time 
was Mayor Shakespeare. You'd think I'm making it up, but no, his name was Joseph Shakespeare. Lived from 1837 to 1896. He was mayor of New Orleans from 1880 to 1882, then again from 1888 to 1892. He had been an iron worker by profession and previously had served one term in the state legislature. Anyway, Mayor Shakespeare uh, told the Picayune, at the time it was the Daily Picayune, uh, later the Times and the Picayune merged, anyway, but it, at the time and it was just the Daily Picayune, he told that newspaper uh, that he told police, that he the mayor told the police, to scour the whole city and arrest every Italian you come across. And that was quoted in the newspaper. Nineteen of these guys were ultimately charged with the murder, uh, either you know as accessories or or actually doing the deed. They were held without bail in parish prison. Those arrested included Charles Matrana, or Carlos Matrana, who was charged with plotting the murder, uh, as well as several of the Matrana friends and workers in their businesses. One of one. A uh, guy, one Italian named uh, Pietro Monasterio, was a shoemaker. He was arrested for the crime of living across the street from where Hennessy was standing when he got shot. Another, Antonio uh, Marchese, uh, sold fruit. He was arrested because he was a friend of Monasterio's, the guy who lived across the street from where the shooting took place. And because Marchese was known to frequent the shoe shop of Monasterio. Another, Emanuele Polizzi, was arrested uh, when a policeman, you know, said he thought he recognized him as, as one of the guys that had run away from the scene of the crime. A few days after Hennessy's death, Mayor Shakespeare gave a speech. I know, I shouldn't love, I mean, Shakespeare giving a speech is, is just you know, only in New Orleans. Uh, declaring that Hennessy had been, quote, the victim of Sicilian vengeance, called upon the citizenry to, quote, teach these people a lesson they will never forget. Mayor Shakespeare appointed a committee of 50 to investigate, quote, the existence of secret societies or bands of oath-bound assassins and to devise necessary means and the most effectual and speedy measures for the uprooting and total annihilation of such organizations. On October 23rd, the Committee of 50 published an open letter in the newspapers uh, addressed to the Italian community, encouraging them to hand to expose and hand over anyone among their number who, who was engaged in criminal activity. The letter was signed by the committee's chairman, Edgar Farrar, uh, who later served as president of the American Bar Association. Uh, The Committee of Fifty then hired two private detectives to pose as prisoners, you know, to, to pretend that they had been arrested and were put in jail with the Italians to try to get to try to get them, you know, to to admit or, or give some information that the police hadn't obtained. Apparently, the two detectives did not obtain any useful information because when when it came to trial, they were not asked to testify. Only Polizzi, who appeared to be mentally ill, said anything to incriminate himself. But his confession was deemed inadmissible because he, you know, he was even before this, he was he was there were many who could testify that he was not entirely sane. Meanwhile. The other defendants were sub- subjected to uh, extremely negative pretrial publicity. Across the country, this became a national thing. Newspapers ran headlines with, uh, with you know, headlines that read, you know, examples. Vast mafia in New Orleans. And another one, 1,100, well, then they inserted the, the racial slur for Italians, 1,100 racial slur, criminals. Spurred to action by the popular accounts of Hennessy's murder, a 29-year-old newspaper salesman named Thomas Duffy walked into the prison on October 17, 1890, 
sought out Antonio Scafidi, whom he heard was a suspect, and shot him in the neck with a revolver. Scafidi survived the attack, only to be murdered by lynching a few months later. Duffy was eventually convicted of assault, but only sentenced to six months in prison. A trial for nine of the suspects began on February 16, 1891, concluded on March 13, 1891, with Judge Joshua G. Baker presiding. The defendants, the Italians, were represented by Lionel Adams of the law firm of Adams and O'Malley. The state, the people, were represented by District Attorney Charles A. Lusenberg. Much of the evidence presented at trial was weak or contradictory. The murder had taken place on a poorly lit street on a damp night in a notoriously corrupt city, and the eyewitness testimony was unreliable for that reason. Matrana and another man named Bastiano and Cardona were found not guilty as no evidence had been presented against them. The jury declared four of the defendants not guilty and asked the judge to declare a mistrial for the other three as they could not agree on a verdict for the others. The six who were acquitted, even though they were acquitted, were not released from prison but were held pending an additional charge of, quote, lying in wait with intent to commit murder. District Attorney Lusenberg admitted that without a murder conviction, he would be forced to drop the lying in wait charges. But nevertheless, all nine men were returned to prison. Then, a group of 150 people calling themselves the Committee of Safety, met that evening to plan. The following morning, an ad appeared in local newspapers calling for a mass meeting at the statue of Henry Clay, which was near the prison at the time. Citizens were told to, quote, come prepared for action. Thousands of demonstrators gathered near the parish prison. Uh, the Italian consul in New Orleans, name was Pasquale Corte, appealed for help to the governor of Louisiana, who was Francis T. Nichols, begging him to do something, you know, send militia, do something to prevent an outbreak of violence. Governor Nichols declined to take any action without a direct request from Mayor Shakespeare. Mayor Shakespeare had gone out to breakfast that morning and could not be reached. Inside the prison, the mob started, well, outside the prison, the mob started breaking down, you know, attack, breaking down the doors of the prison with a battering ram. Inside the prison, the, the warden, Lemuel Davis, uh, opened the cells for the 19 Italian prisoners he had and told them to hide as best they could in the building. Uh, other members of the lynch mob included a guy who was elected <laughs> later as governor. John Parker, governor of the state, 37th governor of the state, as well as a future mayor of New Orleans, Walter Flower, the 44th mayor. Uh, the mentally ill guy, Polizzi, uh, who even though you know he wasn't convicted, he was actually he was charges were dismissed. Nevertheless, he was still in prison. Uh, the mob hauled him outside and they lynched him. Uh, literally, they hanged him, hanged him from a lamppost and then shot his hanging body. Antonio Bagnetto, a fruit peddler, was also lynched. He was hanged from a tree, and then his body was shot. Nine others were murdered, either by being shot or clubbed to death inside of the prison. The bullet-ridden bodies of Polizzi and Bagnetto were left hanging for hours. The court and the district attorney uh, then set the, the survivors free and dropped the charges against them, those who had not yet been tried. All of those lynched were Sicilian immigrants, except for Macheca, who was a Louisiana native, um, but, is, but of Sicilian descent, and another guy named Comizzo, uh, who was Italian, but was from Rome, not Sicily. A grand jury convened on March 17, 1891, to investigate the lynching. Judge Robert H. Marr, who presided, was a longtime personal friend of several of the lynch mob participants. On May 5, 1891, 
the grand jury published a report concluding that several jurors in the Hennessy case have been bribed to acquit the Italians. No evidence was offered, and no criminal charges were pursued for jury tampering, uh, as the grand jury claimed it could not identify the participants in either the tampering or the lynching. The Italian government was outraged. They demanded that the lynch mob be brought to justice and that reparations be paid to the dead men's families. When the U.S. government declined to prosecute the leaders, Italy actually recalled its ambassador. The ambassador, Italian ambassador to the United States recalled him in protest. And the United States followed suit, recalling its ambassador from Italy. Later, as part of a wider effort to ease tensions with Italy and to pacify Italian-Americans whose votes he wanted, President Benjamin Harrison declared the first nationwide celebration of Columbus Day in 1892, honoring the 400th anniversary of the discovery of America. Now, you know, we know the, the three ships were paid for by Spain, but Columbus, Christopher Columbus himself, was an Italian. He was born in Genoa, even though he was working for Spain at that point. He was, he was Italian. So that's where Columbus Day came from. Okay, so the same year, 1892. Mother, well now Saint, Francis Xavier Cabrini, arrived in New Orleans, uh, commencing her local ministry to Italian Catholics by establishing an orphanage at 817 St. Philip Street in the French Quarter. She first rented the third floor of a tenement building at that address. Uh, and then later, uh, she raised money. She purchased the building uh, and, and made the whole building an orphanage with uh, three other nuns. One month later, four, other, four more sisters joined them, and they got started to get to know people. I mean, they had never been in New Orleans before. They knew there were Italians there, so you know how to find them. So they visited the docks. They knew that many Italians are working there, and so they just, I mean, they were in habit, and so, you know, Italians would recognize, you know, religious sisters. So they started visiting the Italians at the docks, getting to know them. Of course, they spoke, you know, they spoke Italian, so they, you know, they easily converse with them. Um, and, and then, you know, told them what they were there for, that they, you know, any children who had been left, uh, you know, parent, without their parents because of, you know, some disease or whatever, a murder, uh, that the, the, the sisters would have an orphanage for them, and also encouraging, uh, you know, those families uh, to improve their lives and that of their children through education. During the yellow fever epidemics of 1897 and 1905, the sisters stayed in the city, caring for the sick and dying, and, uh, and took care of the orphans uh, after. Mother Cabrini continued her traveling, but she periodically returned to New Orleans. Uh, and uh, she knew that a larger orphanage was needed. In 1905, an Italian uh, who was a, a captain in the Merchant Marine had done very well for, mis for himself. His name was Salvatore Pizzotti. Donated $75,000. And in 1905, that was you know significant. For her to purchase the land where the current Cabrini High School is located on Esplanade Avenue uh, next to Holy Rosary Church, although that church was built later in 1920. And with his, as well as other donations, a, a new three-story orphanage and chapel were built on the site. Uh, at 3400 Esplanade Avenue was called initially the Sacred Heart Orphan Asylum. In 1959, the buildings of her orphanage were repurposed as Cabrini High School. Uh, Mother Cabrini's bedroom, uh, which in which some of the, the furniture she actually used to survive, as well as some other of her personal belongings, uh, remain at, at Cabrini High School. And a sculpture of Captain Pizzotti is is uh, still located on the second floor of uh, of Cabrini High School, uh, right down the hall from where Mother Cabrini's room was. Uh, Pizzotti, Captain Pizzotti, he lived from 1839 to 1915. He was, uh, in, in the Merchant Marine, he was a leading importer of tropical fruit. Uh, and when he died, he was buried. Uh, he died here in New Orleans. He was buried in Metairie Cemetery, where you can still visit his tomb. 
Mother Cabrini was naturalized as a U.S. citizen in 1909. She died of complications from dysentery in, at the age of 67 at one of her hospitals, Columbus Hospital in Chicago, Illinois, on December 22, 1917, while preparing Christmas candy to give out to local children. By that time, she and her sisters had established 67 institutions to serve the sick and poor uh, and, and to train you know, future generations. She was beatified in 1938 by Pope Pius XI, canonized in 1946 by Pope Pius XII. In the Roman Martyrology, her feast day is December 22nd, the day of her death. Uh, but the day, well, okay, I'll leave it there. Uh, and she is recognized, among other things, as patron saint of immigrants. All right, so I kind of jumped out of the chronology, but I want to finish her, wanted to finish her story. Uh, so she came in 1889. So that brings us to the, the, the end of the decade. Uh, so we'll uh, stop here, and then, and then the next video will start a new unit on the, the 1890s, uh, which will culminate in 1899 with the papal condemnation of Americanism. So for now, uh, we will pause, uh, and thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.